Good evening, uh, students, alumni, and uh, friends and supporters of the University of Minnesota College of Science and Engineering. Um, welcome to Historic Northrop, those of you that are here in person, and welcome also to those of you that are participating online. Um, my name is Jane Lansing. I'm a 1976 civil engineering graduate from this terrific institution. I am chair of the Dean's Advisory Board and also an enthusiastic supporter, like many of you, of CSE. It is my honor to welcome you to this Inventing Tomorrow program. It's part of a new event series that we are offering to bring you thought-provoking conversations centered around today's biggest challenges. Tonight, we will discuss sustainability and the innovations needed to feed the world's growing populations with climate entrepreneur and CSE alumnus Nick Halla and the chemistry department head, Professor Christy Haynes. Now, I'm a supporter of CSE because I am so grateful for my engineering education and the tremendous impact it's had on my career and my life, but also because of the impact that I have seen that science, engineering, and particularly the collaboration of those across all the disciplines have had in Minnesota and across the world. And Christy and Nick are two terrific examples of this. But there are many more. From the wide-ranging sustainability research being conducted by CSE faculty and students to the um, innumerable ways that CSE alumni are tackling this challenge once they leave the campus, CSE is focused on making an impact on the lives of Minnesotans and beyond. As Dean Angeline says, a hallmark of our community lies in our relentless pursuit of game-changing research. Our faculty, students, and alumni are key players in important areas that affect our people, our planet, and the economy. Tonight, we'll give you a primer on how CSE delivers on this mission. And you'll get a chance to dig much deeper into sustainability research underway across CSE in the forthcoming issue of the college magazine, Inventing Tomorrow. You'll learn more about advances within materials, water, transportation, and energy, a truly inspiring demonstration of what can be done when you have scientists and engineers working in partnership on these problems. Through innovation, creativity, collaboration, and pragmatism, CSE truly impacts the economy of the state of Minnesota and the lives of Minnesotans and beyond. So now it's time to hear from our speakers. So let me tell you a little bit about them. Nick Halla graduated from the College of Science and Engineering with a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering in 2005. He has built his career leading sustainable technology development and commercialization. Halla joined Impossible Foods as its first employee and helped build the company from the ground up during his 11 years there. He held numerous senior executive roles at Impossible Foods, including Chief Strategy Officer, Senior Vice President Retail, and Senior Vice President International. Halla also sat on the board of Kite Hill, which makes yogurt and cheese from almonds. Currently, Halla is working on new climate ideas, including a climate invention factory and business foundry with the mission to rapidly decrease atmospheric concentrations of methane and carbon dioxide to change the trajectory of climate change. In addition, he's an independent board director at Interplant where they are transforming farming by enabling crops to communicate with growers and advising several sustainability driven companies. Christy Haynes is a distinguished McKnight University professor and head of the Department of Chemistry. She has been a faculty member at the University of Minnesota since 2005. She also serves as Associate Director of the Center for Sustainable Nanotechnology and Associate Editor for the journal Analytical Chemistry. Haynes is an internationally recognized leader within scientific community and is one of the nation's most talented analytical chemists. In 2018, she was one of only 173 scientists, scholars, and artists in the United States and Canada to receive the highly competitive Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. Haynes has built a unique research program that addresses questions at the interface of immunology, toxicology, material science, and chemistry. Her work in sustainable nanotechnology focuses on minimizing unintended negative consequences of engineered nanomaterials relevant in energy and biomedicine. 
Her research team also designs, synthesizes, and applies nanomaterials for sustainable agriculture, aiming to increase tr crop yield while minimizing the use of traditional agrochemicals. She earned her bachelor's degree at McAllister College and PhD at Northwestern University. Please join me in welcoming Nick Halla and Christy Haynes. Um, so tonight, Christy and Nick will be addressing questions received from our broad CSE community. And I'm gonna pose the first question to you both to get us started. And then I'll rejoin you at the end to kind of wrap up and, um, uh, and conclude this evening's conversation. So where do world hunger and climate change stand and how will your innovations address these global crises? And Christy, let's start with you and then go turn it over to Nick. Okay, thank you, Jane. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thank you, Nick, for coming. Um, I'm really honored that I get to be the faculty member that sits up mm -hmm. here and does this with you. Um, I, your story is really inspiring, so I think everybody's ready for an evening of inspiration. Um, I'll start with answering Jane's two-part question. So um, how do climate crises and, and food crises go together? I think they're inextricably linked. I don't think you can work on solving one without working on solving the other. Um, and what is my group doing in that space? Jane gave you a little bit of insight, but it's really about increasing crop productivity. So we could feed everyone on the planet if we didn't lose so much of what we try to grow to preventable disease and pests and climate change. And so, in fact, we lose something between 20 and 40% of your average crop to things that, that you could prevent. And so, of course, we have agrochemicals, fertilizers, but those, of course, can also be problematic for the environment because they're over-applied and they're not particularly efficient. Uh, so my group works on nanomaterials, tiny bits of um, matter that are you know, much smaller than you can see that have unusual chemical and physical properties. And actually, a couple of my researchers I know are in the audience. Uh, we designed these particles so that you could actually apply them to plants. They either kind of sneak in through the pores on the leaf or can be infiltrated in the seed. And then once they're inside, they slowly transform and they release a molecule that the plant already has, but in excess now, and it can build up its plant cell walls or it can it, um, mount its own immune response. So the end result is the plant survives those attacks. We can also design nanoparticles that'll promote drought resistance, which are gonna become increasingly important. So if the plant lives longer and it's healthier, of course it produces more food. So that, that's where my research connects. I know you have a different take on this, so maybe you yeah. wanna take a stab at Jane's question. Sounds good, thank you. And I'm excited to be here like talking with you as well. Um, I've had a kind of a fun day today talking to a lot of faculty, being inspired by all the research that's going on here. And I think, you know, to the question, they're very intertwined. And I think there's a couple pieces of this that I, I look at the way we do agriculture, the way we've managed our land and fighting climate change. Like the, the first part is, like you said, it's like we can look at the crops that we have, we lose a lot of yield. Uh, we're not farming overly efficiently and how do we increase that? And so like interplant, as we were talked about, is an example of this where we take essentially, when the, the plant tries to fight that stressor, mm -hmm. um, we don't really know when the plant is really t typically triggered to fight that stress. So an example is like for interplant, the first sensor we're building is a soybean fungal sensor. So what happens in a field with a soybean is if, if soybean attacks a plant, the farmer or the agronomist would see it about two to three weeks later, typically. And by that time, it's too late. You lost a lot of your crops, you lost a lot of that yield. So what farmers typically do is you'll put, it, put fungicides on soybeans if it's in areas where you might have a fungal pressure, and then that leads to over applying. So you actually have a bigger environmental issue and a cost issue. So what interplant does is when that plant gets attacked by the fungus, they get the plant to express a phosphorescent protein in the leaf. And when that happens, then you can read it from satellites. And so in the lab and in the greenhouse, we can see the signal two days after the plant gets attacked by a fungus. Then you can use stuff like this mm -hmm. to treat the plant. And so if we know what's going on, where it's going on, when it's going on, we can put less pest like fungicides on, um, produce higher yields, use less land for agriculture. And this leads to the second one is, even today we actually produce enough food for feeding the world in 2050. We just use it very inefficiently. And so like the thesis of impossible was, if you look at animal agriculture, it's uh, you know, produced like massive amounts of foods for food for people, but it is very inefficient. Like a beef cow is a 3% efficient technology of converting plants into something that we eat and meat. And I thought about this as a chemical engineer like at Minnesota, like what other technology do we use at this scale that's 3% efficient or less? <laughs> and I, I, I challenge a class today on that, it's like, can you give me examples? 
Yeah, we just came up empty. <laughs> <laughs> it's by far the most inefficient process that we run at a global scale. Now, if we take the crops that we feed animals, we take the crops that we produce, all the calories, all the essential amino acids, all the nutrients we need to feed the human population exist in plants, just not in forms that people like to eat. So the way we looked at this impossible is, hey, let's take those same plants, skip the cow, skip the animal, and produce the foods that people love in a much more efficient, sustainable, nutritious, healthy way, and then, and then you know, deliver those to the world. And the only thing that matters to you know, consumers is it has to taste better. And so in order to get consumers to switch over, you can't just say, eat plants. You have to say, okay, eat plants that actually taste better than animals. And so that's what we've been working at Impossible to change that. And then we look at this, the overall climate story, because Impossible from day one has always been a climate company. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're a food company, so how does that kind of link? So now if you take this, and so plants are so much more efficient than an animal, we could feed the world on less than 10% of the land we use today for agriculture if we don't use animals as a conversion technology. Then what we can do is, one, reduce the environmental impact of agriculture massively for climate change. Then two, we can take that excess land and let carbon, like crops and biomass and trees grow back up. And we could flatline greenhouse gases for 30 years. Well, everything else stays the same and buy ourselves 30 years time to solve the climate crisis just by transitioning the world over the next 15 years of plant-based food. And so they are so tied together in really everything. That's a super inspiring answer. Um, a lot to think about even just there. Mm -hmm. I know from our pre-meeting that you're originally from Minnesota, or you at least grew up in Owatonna, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that you were um, grew up around agriculture, and so people will probably draw lots of links there. Uh, since we're sitting at the University of Minnesota, I, I feel like we should think about who belongs here and who should be part of CSE. I'd like to think a little bit about, just maybe say something about our two paths to this, hoping that that welcomes more people in. So I'll start by just saying that um, I, I'm a first generation college student. Neither of my parents went to college. Um, I'm the first scientist in my family that I know of. Um, so this is definitely not part of the culture of my family. I went to lots of different schools during my primary and secondary education all over the Phoenix metro, so nowhere around here. So I had a really itinerant early education um, and then was lucky enough to find myself my way into college and graduate school and a postdoc and a faculty position in an amazing department, right? I'm here in the Department of Chemistry. And despite all of that success, I will say until well after I had tenure, I always felt a little bit like maybe I wasn't a real scientist. Mm -hmm. And that was really because I kind of felt like my background didn't look like what I thought a scientist's background was supposed to look like. And of course, I'm a lot wiser now. I have figured out not only you know, do you need people from all these different backgrounds, like that's actually how we get some of the most innovative solutions, which I, th I think this points to. So I shared a little bit about my, about my path. I wonder if you'll say a little bit mm -hmm. about yours. Yeah. I was like, I think, uh, how many people from Oatana are in the audience right now? Let's see. All right, I see a few hands. There we go. <laughs> so we got some people to come up. Um, but yeah, I grew up uh, just south of Oatana in a small family dairy farm. So even when we were started in Impossible, people were like, wait a second. You're creating plant-based meat and dairy products to replace what your family's done your entire life? I was like, yeah, kind of. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, I remember talking to my brother, who is a, like a farmer through and through. And you know, as a small farmer, our job is to produce good people for people affordably and maintain our land and hand it down to the future generations, which is a combination of maintaining your land and having a sustainable business. And like agriculture has gotten more and more consolidated all the time, and you end up having to produce the commodity prices, and so it becomes really hard to write, run a, a good business any, anymore as a small farmer. And so for me, early on, I knew pretty early I didn't want to be on the farm. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do, and my parents always had a high value for education. Um, and they did both go to college, very probably uncommon for like a, a farm family. Um, but I always knew I wanted to go to college. And then in high, high school, I started really getting into sustainability. I think being on a farm, like we're on the land 365 days of the year. And so I had a deep appreciation for that. And so I started doing renewable energy projects like in high school. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I want to do something with this, and came to Minnesota studied chemical engineering, something that you can do all kinds of different things with. And all the products I did was biofuels design, battery systems, and I did a joint research project that we're going to talk a little bit about. Mm -hmm. um, but coming out of Minnesota, I had honestly no idea what I could do with that. And so I ended up working at General Mills for a while, which taught me kind of how big business runs and how businesses commercialize products. But it didn't hit the sustainability drive mm -hmm. that I wanted, which led me to go to grad school. And I, I snuck my way into Stanford into an MBA MS program. And think about imposter syndrome. It's like I'm a small town farm kid from Minnesota, like going out to Stanford. I'd never heard of Silicon Valley before, or venture capital, 
or any of this stuff. And like all my classmates went to like gold, I went to work at Goldman or these like consulting companies like McKinsey. And it's like, this is the world I knew nothing, absolutely nothing about. And I get there and I remember looking at like all the jobs on the job board my first year. And I went through all of them. I was like, wow, there's not one job in here I would ever do. And I was like, did I go, did I do the wrong thing? And so I started talking to a lot of like friends and a lot of the second year students there. Like, no, no, the startups, because I went there to start a company. Mm -hmm. Start a company in sustainability and renewable energy and things like this. And they're just like, no, no, wait till like April and May to look for your job in June, which is a little weird, um, especially when all the recruiting is in October, November. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, as a small company, you can't you don't know what you're gonna need in June that far in advance. <laughs> you know, like a couple weeks before what you need. And so I ended up working at a solar energy company, which mm -hmm. really got me into that ecosystem. And it kind of just kept building from there and led to meeting Pat Brown, the founder of Impossible, who was a medical school researcher at Stanford, never done anything in food before in his life. And when we started talking about Impossible, the idea it's like, this is worth working on. Mm. That's, that's an amazing story where clearly all those experiences were so important to well, the, getting was, you to it. This right? was the funny part is like, when I left the farm, I was like, I'm never doing agriculture ever again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as I'm doing chemical yeah. engineering, getting into science, and then as I got to General Mills, I was like, I'm still kind of tied to agriculture and food. It's like, all right, I'll do this for a while. So I left General Mills, went to San Francisco. I went across the country. I was like, I am done with food and agriculture. I did nothing in food and agriculture the entire time until I met Pat. And I was like, whoa, this is so different than anything I'd ever heard in food and agriculture. And looking at the impact of it environmentally, globally, mm -hmm. in something that fundamentally is so inefficient with so much opportunity to change, I was like, and it fit my background so well. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I got to do this. Yeah. That's an, it's an amazing, amazing place to think about disrupting something, a system that you were so close to. Um, I love hearing your story and thinking about our backgrounds. And this makes me think about the fact that I heard earlier today that you recently endowed a scholarship here at the University of Minnesota. And I am so thankful for that. That generosity is a big deal. Certainly, you know, I would not have been able to go to college without scholarships and, and um, other financial aid. I actually graduated in three years instead of four because I couldn't afford a fourth year of college. <laughs> um, so I wonder if you want to say a few words about the HALA Sustainability F Scholarship and kind sure. of what you hope to accomplish with it. Yeah, and it's uh, impressive if you've graduated in three years from a technical program. When you have to. Yeah, <laughs> still. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I did get a lot of scholarships in undergrad, and I applied to anything and everything that I could find. Because, uh, you know, with a small family farm, it's like, you know, we don't have the ability really to you know, partake in helping with college. And so I was financially independent pretty early, which, it, like, looking back at it, gave me so many life skills that were advantageous to everyone else that didn't have that, like, experience growing up, how to manage money, what it means, and, like, working at jobs that you can, you know, make your living yourself very early. Um, but what helped a lot at the U here is, you know, there was a lot of scholar there was a lot of scholarship opportunities, and so I applied to a ton. You know, I was able to get a few, mm -hmm. which helped a lot in you know keeping you know debt down. And then uh, when I left, I was like, you know what, I I really want to give back to this community when I have the ability to. And so I remember talking to the university, you know, several years even before, um, that is like once I have the ability, I want to start a scholarship. So I went through the process and what mm -hmm. it's going to take, and I was like, okay, I need this, this, and this. Is like I need it to line up. And then, um, you know, with some of our success in like Impossible, I started to get an opportunity to. And so I put it together, wrote up what I wanted. Definitely wanted it to be about sustainability and driving for global impact. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started thinking more about it. I wanted to bring it back to my family. And so my, my dad went to the University of Minnesota for animal science and agriculture. My sister um, studied psychology here. She's in the audience somewhere. <laughs> there you go. Then she bailed and went to Georgia uh, for a while. But, yeah, she did her undergrad here. Um, and I thought about you know, like the connection of um, farm and sustainability, as we talked about in agriculture, to the work that I've done and the work that my sister does in psychology and helping you know, people be more sustainable and healthier in the world. And I was like, you know what, this Hall of Sustainability Scholarship is really for our family. And I want to continue to build this over time. That's really impressive. And I'm sure that the first people that have gotten the scholarships find it really valuable. I heard you're actually going to meet with yep, someone I have lunch tomorrow. tomorrow. That's amazing. Yep. That, that seems great. Um, mm -hmm. It goes without saying that I am so pleased that you're investing in the University of Minnesota and the students. I think it's a great place to invest. Uh, one of the things that I think is really special about the College of Science and Engineering here at the U is the really collaborative nature, which I, I know you experienced. And so I'll just say, for my particular research group, by design, we are a group that works at kind of the messy interfaces between fields. So, you know, material science, and agriculture, not your kind of most normal mm -hmm. space of working. And um, 
being here in the College of Science and Engineering with an amazing medical school right across the street and an amazing policy school just down the street makes this kind of work really doable. I have a lot of friends at other institutions and I know that the barriers are lower here than they are other places. Um, and so I was thinking about, you told me that when you were an undergrad here, you were able to do research in both a chemistry and a mechanical engineering lab. And so I wondered if you just wanted to say some words about kind of what that experience was like mm -hmm. and maybe, I don't know why you think doing research like that at the U is particularly like special or, or, or possible. Yeah, I think, um, so I was, a, I started as a material science when I came to school and quickly just, I just loved chemistry and so I switched to chemical engineering. Um, and so what I still was tied to the chemistry department and I had yep. some very good professors. And one of my uh, general chemistry professors, uh, Professor Jeff Roberts, um, said in class like, hey, we're looking for you know, a research associate for the summer to come work in the lab and they'll help us build some stuff. I was like, huh, I've never worked in research before. Um, it'd be something really good to learn. It's like, maybe I can get this. And so I like, reached out to him. Uh, we got along pretty well, so I joined the group for the summer. And I think uh, this kind of links to a lot of parts of my career. I was like, I'd never done anything like that before. Mm -hmm. But as like, I was willing to put myself in that situation and take that risk um, to try and see what I could do. And then what I've learned typically when you get in there, then it's like, if you treat people well, and you essentially approach it with your, we talked about this earlier, like heart before your head in a lot of this, and then you build good relationships, and then you do good work, more opportunities come. And so I did this, uh, so the project was between mechanical engineering and chemistry. While I'm studying chemical engineering, so I'm essentially in three departments <laughs> at once. Love and then that. I, and then I did a business <laughs> minor too at Carlson, so I had to pull, pull that side in. Um, but uh, then you can pull all this together, and then uh, after the first summer, you know, it didn't have like that much funding for the project, and so during the year, there wasn't really funding available. And I started talking to Professor Roberts, and I was like, well, actually, we need a couple more TAs for the Gen Chem Lab, which I had taken my freshman year. And so the next three years, I ended up TAing and teaching like general chemistry. And I never thought about teaching before, but I loved it. It was so much fun. Um, there was times where I was teaching seniors as a sophomore, and they found out as a sophomore, like, wait a second, what? Yep. Um, and it's not like I was like, not much better, just the opportunity that I was there in front of me and I was able to take it and learn. And you know, I, I can learn, and, and I learned a lot about how teaching teaches me, too, a lot more about the materials. You become more of an expert just by teaching it <laughs> while you teach them, and it taught skills that were super useful in my career later on. <laughs> and I think you know, the university here encourages a lot of that. And so it's not like you have to be in your department and just in your department doing this. You can do stuff across a lot of different parts, which that's how the world works. That's how businesses work. <laughs> Definitely startups where you have to wear pretty much every hat. You hit on several topics there that are near and dear to my heart. So undergraduate research, I think, you know, in CSE, that is the best thing our undergraduate majors can do is find a lab, get their hands on something. Um, and I will say that, you know, we're always still looking for funding to help pay people so they don't have to TA <laughs> so they can do research all year long. I have some amazing undergrads that work in my lab. Um, but it's funny to me that you also mentioned TAing, general chemistry, uh, because lots of things on campus have changed since you were here. One thing that has not changed at all are the general chemistry laboratories in Smith Hall. <laughs> I know this well, my office is in this building. Mm -hmm. um, and I have amazing colleagues that are masterful at teaching, but honestly, they've been doing it a little bit um, a little bit disadvantaged by the mm. space. I mean, actually, if you've seen the Gen Chem Labs in Smith Hall or the Organic Chem Labs or the Analytical Labs, um, they are classic laboratories. But the truth is, like, chemical safety culture has changed, pedagogy and curriculum have changed. And so the faculty have been doing great work, but a little hamstrung. I bring all this up because, of course, if you were following what our legislature was doing, you know that in May, in their bonding bill, it included money to build a new chemistry teaching building. Um, and so this is a giant deal. I'm so happy to live in a state that, that supports this. Um, we did a kickoff uh, for the new Fraser Hall, if you remember where Fraser Hall was, that's gonna be the chemistry teaching lab in September. Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan were here. It was a super inspiring day. And so I, I wanna make sure everybody who's a fan of the um, university knows that with this reimagined, renovated Fraser, so there'll be 18 teaching labs, it's all teaching lab space, um, 
we'll be kind of at the leading edge of instruction. There will be like amazing new spaces for students to work collaboratively as they do these um, investigative laboratories. Um, it will obviously benefit all the industry partners that we're doing workforce development for because we'll have students working together on complex projects. And it is a big undertaking. I will say the total cost for the building is $144 million. So chemistry is not cheap. Um, and of course our state will pay two thirds of the cost for that, which is a great show of support. Um, the other third, of course, has to come from philanthropy or other fundraising. And so we're, we're working on that. But definitely, if any of you have the opportunity to like rally support to, to mm -hmm. get that done, uh, please, I will appreciate that. Um, and I will just say, since we're talking about your undergrad days, I just want to know, are there other things in your experience at the U that you want to talk about? I mean, you talked about some chemistry classes, but chemical engineering is where your major was. So. Yeah. I think it's, I think about my time at the U and it's like the first time for me, like off the farm and like, you know, here. So there's a, and even like when I got to Stanford too, it was a similar, it's like as much personal learning as any sort of education. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, yeah, a bunch of my roommates are here that are some of my closest friends <laughs> um, too. And it's like, I learned so much from them about just life skills yeah. and how to integrate into different, and like, like my roommates are mechanical engineering majors, business majors, liberal arts. And it's like, it was kind of across university. Yeah. And so I think that that's where like this university setting is so good for collaboration and learning across different things that you never would get exposure to at once. Mm -hmm. Any other way if you kind of put yourself over there. And one of the things I had is, um, so I did a, like the undergrad, um, like kind of like technology honors program, which was nice that it, it was like kind of a smaller subset of uh, people. And our physics professor was always uh, kind of a rallier of people together. And so after our physics three class, he took a bunch of us to uh, Italy. Oh. And uh, we studied, uh, exactly, <laughs> totally Amazing. different. And it, this is like, I'll use an example too. As a small family farmer, the first time I was ever on a plane was when I was 19 years old in school here, flying to Atlanta to see my sister. I was like, like, I don't know, three weeks after 9-11. Oh. Or like, no, a couple months after 9-11. It was the first time I ever flew on a plane. So I don't know any sort of like, like flying before 9-11. And then this is the first time I've ever been abroad. Mm -hmm. And it's with this like physics professor with a bunch of students who are studying particle physics. And we went to Italy, Switzerland, and France mm -hmm. doing this. And it was an amazing trip. And we met up with a liberal arts crew from Minnesota, uh, Minnesota and Florence that was studying like mm -hmm. arts. And so they had you know, a couple days with them. And it's like those types of experience are really transformative in an education and in a life mm -hmm. that it gave me exposure. And now it's like, I've traveled abroad. I lived in Hong Kong for two years. Mm -hmm. I lived in London for some time. And now it's like the international side is like totally different. And that was like the start yeah. of this. Um, yeah. I hope that your scholarship lets some students that wouldn't be able to do that, do that. That would be an amazing outcome. Um, we should talk about Impossible Foods because I think that's probably what most mm. people want to hear about. So um, Impossible Foods uh, has obviously been a big success that a lot of people wouldn't have seen. Mm. And so I have, I have two questions joint here. So when you joined as employee number one, as Jane said, you know. Did, did you have a sense for how big Impossible Foods was going to be? And then how did you think about disrupting the, you know, behemoth industry that is agriculture? The sense, maybe. The vision, okay. too, yes. The vision for the company didn't change from day one. Mm -hmm. And so I met Pat Brown. So Pat Brown is a scientist uh, from Stanford. He had been in uh, medical research for 25 years there and one of the most like successful scientists there. And so two things he had done, he'd started an organization called the Public Library of Science, which is an open access public journaling system, which really the idea was that, hey, when researchers do research, everybody should be able to access that research, especially a lot of it's publicly funded, mm -hmm. but the way the publishing world works, a lot of times it's behind a paywall. And you have to pay to get it. It's like, that's totally backwards. So they started the biggest the open access journal to make it much more accessible to help science advance. This is PLOS. PLOS. Okay. Yep, PLOS, the Public Library of yeah. Science. Yep. And um, so he had that mindset, and then he invented the DNA microarray, which is the basis of genome sequencing. And so he's, he could kind of do whatever he wanted to. And so he took a sabbatical in 2009 to look at, as a biochemist, how he could have the biggest impact on the world. And he looked at renewable energy at first, mm -hmm. you know, sustainability and driving this. But he quickly realized that by far the biggest environmental impact we can make is build products and outcompete animals and really remove animals from the food system. And the data, and this is like where I was in animal agriculture and food, I'd never mm -hmm. heard this, and it's like 45% of the world's land surface we use for agriculture. And the vast majority of that's for animal agriculture because of that inefficiency. More than 25% of the water used every year goes to animal agriculture, more greenhouse gases than the entire um, transportation system combined. 
and we've lost more than 60% of all species on Earth by weight over the last 40 years, almost all driven by essentially our expansion of animal agriculture. And like a stat that we, when we started looking at this, we looked at the, the weight of all livestock on Earth compared to the weight of all wild vertebrates left of fish, reptiles, amphibians, mm -hmm. uh, mammals, and the weight of all livestock on Earth today is 10 times the weight of all wild vertebrates left. And it's like, we can't keep pushing out everything else for our you know, hunger for meat, fish, and dairy foods. I mean, we have to create a better system. And then we looked at those numbers like, wow, it's like, I was looking at solar energy. I was working in solar energy at this point in time. And there was like 200 companies in California doing solar energy where no one was working on this. Mm -hmm. And the impact of this, if we can do this, under the fundamental idea that the only way to change a system that big is to create products that are better and then let the consumer choose. And so like Pat would say is like, okay, I know we need to do this. I don't know how we're gonna do it, but as a biochemist, I know it's possible. And then we kind of have to because the world's depending on us. It's like, it's like you know, kind of the statement. And then one of our first internal mottos was we're gonna change the way the world looks from space. And that was within the first couple weeks of the company. And the idea is like, you know, we can change the way that we've you know, expanded our footprint for agriculture, let more natural vegetation come back to that system, reduce the pressure on uh, pollution and waterways because of mm -hmm. over fertilizing, um, over spraying pesticides and fungicides, mm -hmm. and let some of those ecosystems recover. It's like there's so many ways we could change essentially how systems run and to the point where we can easily see our impact from space. Yeah. And so that was like from day one. Mm. Now the question is, how are we going to do that? <laughs> And so it was always an idea. And so when we I joined Pat, he had this vision. And so a lot of my job then was to take his big vision and say, okay, recreate, meet, go. And I was like, okay, <laughs> anywhere to start? He's like, okay, well, how about you get me every single plant-based ingredient in the world? I was like, any specificity to that? He's like, no. And so I did all this kind of, I remember talking to this like uh, plant-based, uh, it was actually just like an oil, like oil research distributor. And it was like, okay, let's look at your portfolio. Can you give me one of everything that's not from animals? He's like. Uh, what do you mean? And I was like, okay, do you want this? Like, okay, no, that's $10,000. We can't afford that. And it would never be scalable in a product anyway. <laughs> and so we put parameters on. I think we ordered like 80 different types of vegetable oils. And so to try to get the fat system going and mm -hmm. stuff like this. And so we did a lot of just wide open brainstorming creativity to try to make the vis this vision a reality. That's amazing ambition. And I mean, the money part of this, that might have, must have been very interesting. But um, mm -hmm. I think a question that when we were talking last week came to me um, because you said you knew right away that this was going to be big. You had the vision for it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, how do you think you know which advances are going to be the, be the hits and have the most impact? I mean, it sounds like you found an expert that you identified, but I'm guessing there's more to it than that. Yeah, I think um, in this one, the fit, as we talked about my background in this, yeah. I was like literally looking not to do this. And then I ran into it. I was like, I think I have to do this. Yeah. Um, so I think you're looking for fits of experience, and so you can take my experience that I had there and apply it in a new way that can really have a bigger impact than anything mm -hmm. I was doing before is a big part. Um, then for this, I remember talking to, like there's two conversations as I'm looking, coming out of Stanford, it's, I mean, it's not a cheap education. I had to do an MBA and I did an MBA MS. And I look at this and it's like, I'm not somebody that really ever was comfortable with a lot of debt. And so I was like, you know, could I start a company coming out of an institution like, like this or just coming out with this much you know, debt coming out. And one of the professors looked at me and was like, you're graduating from this degree with this education. Unless you completely F up, you're gonna be totally fine. And I was like, huh, okay. It's like, you know, and this comes back to treating people well, leading with your mm -hmm. heart and just working hard. Mm -hmm. I was like, there's so many different ways to succeed if you put yourself out there that there'll be more opportunities. And the second one is when I talked to the venture firm who introduced me to um, Pat, um, they're like, you know what, you know, if the science doesn't work here, but you do your job well, we're gonna have another dozen companies waiting for someone like you. Now you'll have more experience and be able to you know, take that into here too. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of part of the Silicon Valley ecosystem mm -hmm. where it enabled me to take that risk. Now I fast forward now, and I look at that, and some of what I got to Impossible is just straight blind luck, right? And I think a lot of this is like timing for startups is there, getting lucky is there, but I also kind of believe is like, you, we put ourselves in positions to get lucky. And that's like, I, was, I didn't know anything about where I was gonna go when I went out there, and so I just integrated myself into this venture scene because that's where a lot of technologies were. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, I put myself in there with my background to get lucky to find an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And now I think about this and you know, how to like, look at the ideas I'm working on, and we'll talk about that. Um, I have a lot of ideas about what thing makes things more scalable, mm -hmm. especially in the climate and some of this infrastructure work that we do. Um, some of it's right and some certainly is not. 
uh, but like my instincts were impossible. One thing that makes it much more higher probability of success mm -hmm. than a lot of others is you can price. And so a lot of stuff I looked at energy as in solar energy. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day for solar, it's like if I as a consumer was running my blender or my refrigerator, I don't know where that electron is coming from. It could come from solar, it could come from wind, it could come from coal. Mm -hmm. I don't really know, I just pay a price on that. And so there's like one price for that electron no matter where you get it from. And so then as you're putting new technologies in, you have to compete at that price. Mm -hmm. With food and a lot of these systems, you know, for Impossible, as we're scaling up, we have a really small production. Um, and then we build our first factory and then we expand after that. It's like we did like three, four, five price drops as we scaled up and that entire time we were profitable as a company. And so when you're profitable as a company, it enables a lot more ability to invest and grow. Mm -hmm. And so then you could start at the high end and we started with like these you know, top end chefs like David Chang in New York City, Michael Simon in Detroit and Chicago, like these meat chefs of America that gave us a credibility that, hey, this is not a plant-based product. This is meat made for meat eaters made from plants. Mm -hmm. And we kind of rebranded the category that way. We could start at that higher end and then get to the better burger chains, then get to fast food and hit retail. And as we did that, price dropped as we got scale and we could pass that price on and that the economy's on to consumers. Mm -hmm. And so I look at this now in climate, I look at this, okay, if you're building something now that you have to compete with a commodity, commodity price and maybe you also need a $500 million factory to try to compete with that, the risk profile is so high and your opportunity to succeed there is that that window, that small of a window. So I look at it as like, you know, how can we build more modular systems? Things that you can deploy in ways where you can, you know, get learnings early of the smaller amount of capital um, to prove the concept, either before you need to start building bigger or where you can number up and add like incremental ones versus scaling up to bigger and more expensive systems. Mm -hmm. And I think in climate and a lot of the, a lot of energy stuff, a lot of the food stuff, I think those are really powerful ways to do it. I learned a lot just listening to that. That all sounds like lots of successes. And so I wonder if you can also <laughs> say some words about obstacles. So there, there must have been obstacles and lessons learned. And I think, mm. I, I think people can benefit from hearing that sometimes. Um, and so I just wonder if you can point to a time when maybe an obstacle even led you to more innovation. Yeah, I think um, failures definitely drive innovation to get through them. There's like so many examples. Mm -hmm out of this, and I mean, there's days that impossible, where we'd hit, we'd hit the highest high, we found some, something out new, then we hit something that's an obstacle, it's like, we're dead, like on the same day. And you go through these cycles and all the time, like, ah, <laughs> and you do this, and it's like, you kind of learn to kind of mute it. And I think as we built as a company, one of the things as the executives that we built, our job is to take those oscillations and mute them as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So the team could take that as, okay, something great happened, it's good, but we gotta move on. Something horrible happened, yeah, don't worry about it, we'll find, we'll find a way. You know, and one of them, one of the key learnings we had early on was that you know there's about 750 billion pounds of meat consumed globally every year. And it's very diverse. And when you cook meat, it transforms as you cook it. It goes from soft to hard. Mm -hmm. You have the explosion of flavor and aroma that comes off. So if you do something rare versus well done, the flavor is really different. The aroma is really different. And what we learned is there's a protein in meat called myoglobin, which is a heme protein. Mm -hmm. And you can think about this as like hemoglobin in our blood. So hemoglobin takes oxygen from our lungs to our muscles and our organs. Myoglobin stores oxygen in our muscles. And we found a heme protein called leg hemoglobin in, in legumes and plants that has that exact same heme, drives it chemistry. And we learned when we were doing the early research on this that we could even just take like chicken. We do like beef versus chicken. It's like, okay, this one tastes like beef. This one tastes like chicken in a blind taste test. We put the heme concentration of chicken up to the same as beef. People thought it was beef. And we just learned how powerful that was as a, as a molecule because what it did is it catalyzed all that chemistry. And so instead of having to put like fake flavors in, mm -hmm. we had put heme in and drive the exact same chemistry that happens in beef. Mm -hmm. And so it was a much more simple, elegant, and much more um, approachable way to like chefs and stuff to do this because, hey, it's doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now to the failure. So the first two years, we farmed it. And so you can do this. If you take like a soybean in the summer and you pull up the root system, there's these little nodules on there and you cut them open, they're blood red. That's heme. Yeah. And so we were harvesting this, we were building all these, and we had my cousin and my brother and like farms in Texas and farms in Argentina trying to build systems where we we're literally digging up these plants, trying to harvest these little tiny the nodules, nodules. Yep. and then extracting heme. We, I think the biggest harvest we had was like 40 grams. And it's like, you can't make many burgers off 40 grams of heme, very, very few. And I'm like doing all these different ideas, like maybe do hydroponics, maybe do aeroponics, and we do all this other stuff and trying to figure different farming mechanisms to do it and just pulling our hair out. 
And then we talked to uh, somebody from uh, the biotech world. And they're like, you know, you can do that by fermentation. And so uh, like, we're, this isn't a scale. So we're looking for anything we could possibly do to scale this up mm -hmm. in a cost-effective, scalable way. And it wasn't going to be agriculture. We could engineer plants, too, but that has a different life cycle mm -hmm. to it. And once we found fermentation, we learned that you know, with uh, industrial fermentation processes that have been scaled for 40 years, um, and whether it's medical, uh, food with like enzymes like rennet, um, like insulin is a common one in medical that was done by uh, Genentech early on, and then also just in industrial products. And we're like, wow, you can actually get these at low cost. And now we're not going to hit that low cost as a really dirty system. You have to make your food safe. But there's this middle ground that if we can get the fermentation process to work at this type of yield, this actually really works well. Mm -hmm. Started doing experiments, and within, like, I would say within months, we're producing more than we ever did on the farm. And it's like, okay, now we have a scalable way. Do this. Then you kind of fast forward forward, and we're trying to learn how to do this long term. And I remember this other failure, which was turned out almost really painful, but we found an innovation around it. Was we had because you have to do this fermentation, so it's just like beer making. So you have a you know fermenter, you have yeast in there, it makes like beer, or in here we make heme out of it, uh, and then you would typically have some sort of downstream process that then turns it into the beer in your can, or in our case, like a more purified protein. And we're scientists for the most part. Uh, and our, com our process was way too convoluted. And we had this piece of equipment in there, and I won't say what it is, but it was a, one that there are industrial applications where it's scaled. And we're working with this company on it, and they're like, okay, so a commercial scale, one of this will cost you $4 million. But there was something that didn't feel right. And there was some complexity there that always didn't quite add up. And so when I hired a business development person, I was like, one of the first things, like, here's these like, five different deals that we have with partners. This one like, worries me. Jump in, and so he jumps in, and a month later we get a quote for the commercial scale, and it's twenty-four million dollars. So it went from four million, three, four million to twenty-four million dollars, and we're like, "What?" It breaks all the economics of everything we're going to do. So now we're back to mm -hmm. a completely unscalable process again. So we talked to the engineering team and the science team. Was like, "Okay, let's see if we can find a different way around it." And at the same time, we're negotiating with the supplier and trying to find different avenues. Next day, it's fourteen million. And I was like, "Now, essentially, the trust with this organization is gone." out of this, and so we know we don't want to work with them. And within a month, the R&D team had a completely different solution that got rid of that unit operation. And now, and this process was 10 times more scalable without it. And so things like that is like, it totally forces action in a mm -hmm. positive way. Now you think you might be dead, but then you find a way around it. <laughs> Your former chemical engineering professors must be happy to hear you mention unit operation. I know, I, I, I threw that one in there on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a lovely class, right, that you take, uh, yeah. Um, there's a quote of yours that I that I want to ask you about. So the quote is, the only way we're going to change the system is by doing something completely out of the box. Clearly, that's what we've been talking about. Um, and so I, I know your impossible is not your main gig now. And so I'm wondering if you're willing to say what, mm -hmm. what's next for you? What's the next impossible that you're going to take on? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it is a good question. I've been thinking about this for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And I think you know one of the challenges I had with impossible is like my first business job. Like, I'd worked as an engineer, and we started from just me and Pat. Mm -hmm. And so my heart was so tied, and my identity was so tied to the company. Yeah. It's almost like our family farm in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, how can I ever think about le like doing something else? And so, you know, a bunch of stuff kind of, you know, progressed. And honestly, even living in Hong Kong for a couple years during COVID helped me kind of start breaking that tie a little bit. And then the biggest thing was I started thinking about more about what else I could do. And I looked at actually a lot of water technology, because water is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge with that is there's no price, and it's really hard from a capital markets perspective mm -hmm. to think about how to do things to really solve the global issues. Um, still an issue. It's still something I think about. But then I got to climate and just general climate science. And so what I looked at is if you look at like the trends and the projections, we need to drop um, emissions of CO2 equivalents. And so this is methane, nitrous oxide, and CO2 mm -hmm. down by 40% by 2030 to stay under 1.5 Celsius. And the, the way the policies are in place right now, if we hit the global policies in place in decarbonization, we're on path for 2.6 to 2.9 Celsius. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and I look at this, and last year was our highest emissions year we've ever had, ever. And we need to drop that 40% by 2030 in all these heavy industries. I was like, there's just no way we're going to get there. Um, but I'm an optimist. And I think as an entrepreneur, you kind of have to be an optimist, too. And I was like, there's got to be some different routes. And I started having some ideas. Mm -hmm. And so I had some ideas. and I. Uh, group climate work in three buckets. It's the decarbonization, like transitioning meat to plant-based foods, um, energy from coal and natural gas to solar, wind, and nuclear, and stuff like that. Um, and we need to keep working on that, but we need to work on two other buckets. One is we've done all this negative engineering to the world. 
how do we undo it with business models that can scale? And that would be, we've done CO2, methane, nitrous oxide pollution. We have a lot of land degradation. We talk about farming, mm -hmm. water pollution. How do we build businesses that could actually pull that back and undo the harm that we've done? And I have a bunch of ideas on how to do this a lot in methane, which is a short-term opportunity in nitrous oxide as we talked about earlier today. Um, third one is climate is changing. How do we build more adaptive, resilient systems and manage it to reduce the impact on people, societies, and the environment? Mm -hmm. And like inner plants, a good example of that in agriculture is where if we know what's going on with the plants, the stressors change as climate hits and things change, but if we know what's going on, we can treat it without losing a lot of yield. And so that led me to a high school dream I had. Um, so what got, so this is like the, the trigger on this. So I was like working on some of these ideas and I was talking to a friend and it kind of popped in my head as something I hadn't thought about in 10 years. Because what got me into science and technology was learning about Thomas Edison. And I was like, I always wanted to recreate Thomas Edison's invention factory. I was like, oh, maybe I could actually do this now. <laughs> so what I'm trying to do is essentially create a business foundry invention factory focused on commercializing technologies and take things that kind of fit within some of these theses and some of these areas I just talked about that can really have major impact. And then internally building them for about two years and getting the team, the technology, and the business and things that could actually really mm -hmm. scale and have an impact. And then we spin them out. And so it's really kind of helping the entrepreneurial team. It could come from a university lab, could come from an entrepreneur. We might be able to just do it internally if we have our own idea. Doesn't matter, but the idea is we have a team of essentially people who know how to build hard tech companies at scale. Mm -hmm. and you get them set up the right way right away with the right guidance to help them have a bigger impact faster. That's super interesting. Offline, I'd love to hear how you're gonna pick what you focus on there, because that tricky. seems that seems like a really exciting opportunity and also a little bit intimidating. Um, I will just say, you know, thank you for thinking out of the box. Impossible Foods is cool, and this sounds amazing. Um, I, I think we are coming up on time. I've been getting the cue from over there. <laughs> and so I think Jane is going to join us and ask us one last question. Yeah, so I, th I think I speak for everybody that we could listen to you guys talk about this all night long. It has been absolutely fascinating. Um, and having you talk about not only your big ideas, but also your passion for the subject of sustainability, I think everybody in the audience would like to just hear from each of you personally as to what do you think is the single most important thing that an average person can do to build a more sustainable future? And Nick, let's start with you. Sure. Um, you know, I always start in the, in the US, the average consumer um, produces about 16 tons of CO2 equivalent emissions every year. Um, and this is like, you know, what's driving uh, climate change. It's just part of generally our lifestyle. And I think there's a lot of like small changes we can make and just think about and be aware of that can really change our impact. And so we talked about food. You know, food is really the biggest one is like if you eat less meat, less dairy and eat more plant-based foods, you're just by making that choice, making your diet much, much more sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so I think about that, and my prog progression went there over time where when he started Impossible, I ate meat every meal. I was like, I came from a beef and dairy farm. That's essentially what culture was. And then you know, every year I learned more, and I learned how to cook and stuff like this. And so every year I just ate less. And then once Impossible became more prevalent, it became easier and easier essentially to move fully vegetarian and mostly vegan, but you know, fully vegetarian at this point. Cheese is really hard. We need better cheese products. So I'm helping a few companies do that too, hopefully. <laughs> It's like, yeah, especially the dairy farmers, like, man, like the, the cheese out there is just so bad that's not dairy. Um, but essentially, then essentially, like, I look at this, like, I, I'm not perfect in that from a sustainable, but every year I just kind of ate less to the point where I got to a point where they really wasn't eat, I don't, haven't eaten meat in many years now, but it wasn't really driven by some, like, I don't know, like, virtue or anything. It was just, you know what, every choice I make matters. And so that, and essentially, I got rid of my car. I take public transportation really anywhere I can go. Um, little changes like that can really matter. And so as you think about your own like, carbon footprint on this, you can do this. And a lot of things we're working on with this builder is how do we give consumers more agency in doing this? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the, the other side of like undoing the negative engineering, it's like, yeah, I took a flight from Europe over here. I could offset my flight by buying carbon projects or stuff like this. But as a consumer, I'm not really doing anything. I'm just kind of donating my money to mm -hmm. this company to maybe do something with it. What if you give people opportunities where you can plant trees in your yard that sequester carbon? Like a good growth tree sequesters 20 to 30 kilograms of carbon every year. Put those in your yard. Now you're a steward of this. Mm -hmm. Put organisms in your lawn that essentially can essentially eat methane, nitrous oxide, and CO2. Um, I have a bunch of other ideas too, but mm -hmm. I think just think about the little things in your life that can really drive a big impact. And now if more of us do this as a collective, the global impact is massive. Yeah, and the cultural shift that comes with that. Totally. Um, I don't know, I have a planned answer, but one came to me as we were sitting here, with, like what people can do. I mean, based on this conversation, I feel like um, 
you know, supporting students that want to study science and engineering at places like the University of Minnesota seems like a thing to do because we end up mm. with people like Nick um, <laughs> who are outside the box making giant changes. Um, my, 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 the answer I thought of ahead of time is, you know, I think in the U.S. at least, um, you know, one way we make change is by voting with our pocketbook or with our votes. Mm. And so, yep. you know, obviously choosing, this is what you're saying, choosing yep. products that have sustainability at their kind of core, yeah. in their heart, as Nick was telling us, and also telling the people that are our, you know, local, our state, our federal legislators that this is something that's important to you. And I'll just add a pitch because I'm a professor and I care about federal funding <laughs> that, um, of course, you know, encouraging our legislators to give money to the National Science Foundation or the USDA or the EPA or the National Institutes of Health that are focused on sustainability-based research, that is the way a lot of these projects get started. And so I, I think, yeah, voting with your, with your money and your vote. I'll have one other thought on this as we wrap up. You made <laughs> me think about this with education. Yeah. Um, when we would put roles uh, for Impossible in different ones and say I'm hiring a director of sales or like development in Asia, we would have thousands of applicants within a couple months. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you think like somebody in the, like a beef company would do this, they'd probably get dozens. Like the younger consumers want to and want to work in these topics. And so I talked with this with a lot of professors and like you know, universities. Like like all our all our students want to work in sustainability. Mm -hmm. And so with that is like you know whether you're company A, B, or C in any industry, at the end of the day you're going to be a sustainability company. That's where the world is going. Um, and so, you know, adopting it and pulling that into your jobs and everything else, I think is going to also be a huge thing that you can do in their professional life besides their personal life. Yeah, that's a great one. Well, Nick and Christy, thank you so very, very, very much. It was really a wide and ins very inspiring talk. So yeah. thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. I think we have. Sounds good. So, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, in fact, if any of you guys want to hear more, I mean, it's so great to see him in person. I watched Christie's TED Talk before this, and Nick's got a couple of talks online, one at an Asia conference and another, an interview that he did in the UK. And um, just really interesting and fascinating. So if you, if you didn't get enough of this, because I don't think any of us got enough of this conversation, there's more, you can watch more online. Um, so just a couple of closing notes. We're going to be sending everyone who registered for tonight's event a follow-up email with a link to the conversation so you can... Uh, forward this to any friends or people that you want to tell about it after the event. And then on behalf of Dean Aline, who could not be with us tonight, I'd like to thank the donors and members of the CSE Deans Club who are in attendance. The Deans Club honors philanthropic leaders who generously contribute $1,000 or more, or more in an academic year to any CSE program. <clears throat> the Deans Club members and donors who pre-registered for tonight's event can now proceed to the Founders Room, which is on the second floor of Northrop, where Christy and Nick and I look forward to continuing tonight's discussion. And if you have any questions that popped up that you'd like to ask them, you can uh, buttonhole them down there and ask them their questions. If you'd like to learn more about the uh, Dean's Club and including the benefits and exclusive events, please visit cse.umn.edu forward slash Dean's Club. Thank you all very much for coming. We hope you found this conversation interesting and we look forward to continuing to share how CSE and the collaboration of science and engineering is changing the world. Good night. <laughs>